formed by the sand and the gravels, and then you have relatively clean water, and then you do this UV disinfection. Again, this is a modular system. UV, UV disinfection can kill all these pathogens, so the water is not that bad. So that's for drinking water. Uh, now for waste water, so on one hand we use clean water, drinking water, on the other hand we release discharged waste water. Uh, currently speaking, basically 70% of the U.S. populations are discharging, sending waste water to a centralized location. Again, all of the waste water goes to one place, being treated and released back to the environment. So this is a study that compared five different scenarios to see whether we can redesign these water treatment processes to make sure it is robust. Um, but again, if I go through the details, I don't have time to go through the details, uh, the conclusion is none of these scenarios will bear you know, all of these natural disasters, storms or flooding, uh, hurricane stuff. So the top one is conventional. We use drinking water for irrigation, for <coughs> cooking, whatever, washing, and then all of we divide the wastewater into two kinds, <coughs> green water and then also black water. So no matter what we do, we, we can even use green water to generate electricity, we can do uh, digestion, and we can reuse green water or storm water, whatever we do. It is very, very difficult to make sure the wastewater treatment or wastewater discharge uh, is going to be robust. So these are the solutions that I think, uh, again, I guess, other people could have better solutions. And again, number one is can we have decentralized or on-site wastewater treatment? Um, I mean, we could, but again, the cost is not going to be insignificant. So centralized, you have one plant that can treat a million gallons of wastewater. If it's decentralized, again, you have to have individual steps, processes in one place that could be very expensive. Another one is can we have alternative location for a backup or second wastewater treatment plant at a higher elevation. Um, so the wastewater, wastewater treatment plants and show in, on this map, they're all along the coast. The reason is because the wastewater treated, the treated wastewater needs to be released back to the environment. So released to the ocean, that is the most simple and easy solution. So you see all of these wastewater treatment plants are located at very, very low elevations. So here is close along the Hudson River, at Puerto Rico is along the coast, okay, just because it's easy to discharge. Um, so the low elevation means if you have flooding, then these plants will be first flooded. If it's flooded, it will not work. So if we pump, so if we have a disaster, and then we stop pumping this water to these low elevation plants, instead we pump to a higher elevation. Now at a higher elevation, the plants can still function. So you know, it can still do its job. Again, is the public or government willing to build a second or backup treatment plant? Okay, all right, the third one is power supply withstanding natural disasters. A loss of this dysfunctioning is because of loss of power. And so if we could provide or have enough power supply at the place, at the site, that would be better. And also you know, the generators, and also we could have outside green water and green water reuse. Uh, so this is something some people have been working on or doing at their place. But again, at, for example, state level, if we can do this, they can really save a lot of issues. And again, they can save people's life. Thank you. Thank you, Yana, for, yeah, uh, for the administration staying on, on time. And the water is uh, got to be at the top of the solution channel. Uh, most of the casualties of the island were attributed to uh, poor use of the uh, of water, as it happened in most disasters. So our uh, next speaker is going to be my colleague uh, Masoud Andehari, who is a social professor in the civil and uh, uh, and. Uh, Civil and Urban Engineering at NYU, Tango School of Engineering, uh, and he's also a senior fellow and researcher at the Center for Urban Science and Progress, also called as COSP. Masuachi has been involved in some of the projects that Donovan uh, spoke before, and uh, uh, he's going to be talking about 
bringing the pieces together, the social, the water, and the power, and uh, his uh, colleague, uh, my colleague in one big project now with National Science Foundation, looking at critical interconnected infrastructure. Uh, so could you do that? Sure, absolutely. So, so the, 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 um, the project is a collaboration between four universities, uh, City University of New York, presented, uh, presented by my colleague uh, Jorge, University of Puerto Rico, my was Eric Harmson uh, uh, at the UPRM, NYU, myself here, and ASU, Agami Reddy, who's uh, presented by his PhD student here, uh, Thomas. And so um, the, the idea here was that can we um, uh, can we virtually recreate what happened uh, during Hurricane Maria? So perhaps to better understand uh, uh, plans uh, for, for, for rebuilding, plans for mitigation, and so on and so forth in the future. And there are we're focusing on three different areas, and, and, and certainly there is there is the weather, um, there are hydrology, and atmospheric sciences, and hydrogenative processes, the atmosphere by Jorge, and the hydrology by Kramson at, at uh, UPR. Then there is understanding infrastructure performance, which uh, to some extent, uh, um, I would say, both uh, at, uh, at the uh, Arizona State University and, and at NYU, we're looking at it from different angles, and I can present to you briefly what that is. And there's an understanding impact on communities, which again, ASU and NYU are working concurrently uh, on this. So the first year has been to kind of stovepipe <laughs> approach of, of, of individually, we are trying to like uh, make this sort of understanding in our own way, and year two and year three will be trying to bring these uh, together. So I thought maybe I should just present to you each of these areas one at a time. So on the hydrology and, and atmospheric uh, parts of it, Air Thompson and, 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 and students are looking at air that, at specific uh, processes and prediction, of both modeling and measurement of what happened during during Maria, both from a point of view of rainfall intensity, spatial temporal analysis of that, uh, as well as flooding. So the, this is a very interesting work they've been doing with, uh, with uh, the aqueducto, the, uh, uh, the, the Puerto Rican aqueduct and, and sewer authority located in my US. So it's been quite interesting. A lot of good student projects have been coming out of that. Uh, on, on the atmospheric side, so I, Laura Gonzalez and, and, and colleagues have been doing some really great uh, work on uh, basically doing multi-scale modeling of atmospheric processes. Uh, haven't been able and have managed to, to really predict uh, the, uh, the spatial and temporal uh, distribution of wind speed uh, validated through some of the, uh, some of the uh, radar measurements as a matter of fact uh, by uh, uh, Rafael uh, Rodriguez uh, who's uh, sitting here uh, from UPR. So really great, great stuff there uh, that uh, we'll be able to add to this integrated model that, that hopefully will start from year two. Um, on the uh, understanding infrastructure performance side, I uh, have a couple of extra slides on this because uh, there's been, I am more familiar with, with, with this and I thought so perhaps I can give you more details on that. And on this is really in a way method development such that we can perhaps use the experience in Puerto Rico as a validation stage. So by that what do I mean? So one of the examples is the night lights and many of you may have seen some of the work done by NASA on, on mapping uh, the um, you know, global night lights. A lot of really interesting work has been done on, on economic development, economic growth, urban growth, and so on and so forth. And it turns out that night light is actually a pretty good way of, of mapping uh, power loss or performance, uh, uh, power, power delivery uh, uh, performance. So here's a 500 me me measure, uh, measurement resolution of uh, month of September, loss of power, red is high and, 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 and yellow is low. 
Um, and so we, this is basically weekly temporal uh, mapping and um, 500 meters. So, so basically over nine months, at every 500 meter uh, um, uh, position, one can map. And this is very typical. This is, this is very, very typical of what happened in, 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 in every of these uh, 39,000 points that, that is presented here in this plot that pretty much it dropped somewhere around 65 to 80 percent and the recovery was over nine months, was about the rate that you see there. As a matter of fact, if I was to plot the distribution of power loss of power loss capacity, which is like loss of capacity of all the way to 100 percent, which in some cases there were some, what you notice is that the mean is around 80 percent. So in other words, the mean of power loss in the island was approximately 80 percent during the first month. And of course, the recovery has to pick up from there. And, and then if you now look at trying to multiply this by the population density, you end up with some interesting number. The total people day without power for the hurricane Maria was 275 million people days. And so that's integrating over time and space. So moving on now, uh, there are, uh, so we said, okay, so there's this great work done by, uh, as presented uh, uh, earlier by colleagues from New York City, and a lot of the mapping done uh, by FEMA, uh, location-wise, looking at damage. So we thought, can we use some of that ground truth in order to develop um, a method by which we can map these things. So there's some really interesting stuff. So there's high resolution satellite imagery that one could try to look before and after uh, to look at changes. There is aerial uh, photography, which uh, when one looks at it, uh, because these are all stereo imagery, one can recreate three dimensional. This is right away after, uh, after Hurricane Maria, actually uh, five weeks after Hurricane Maria. Uh, so it's interesting to be able to generalize this in, in a way that a computer uh, vision, uh, photogrammetry, uh, basically vision, uh, to recreate three-dimensional uh, spaces within within the island and try to, uh, you know, use the ground truth as a way of validating some of these basic techniques. And then LIDAR, which is quite uh, high resolution, being able to recreate again. This is whoops, this is that's island-wide. Um, that's island-wide. Uh, I guess I don't have the other stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. So be able to, to map the power, power line losses, uh, the vegetation losses, and uh, uh, the infrastructure damage. So it's in a way kind of capacity building, um, try to use Puerto Rico as, as, as a way to grow. So now, moving on to um, the community side. So here's, um, I would say perhaps is one of the more innovative um, aspects of the project. And this is with colleagues who are uh, at NYU who are, who are looking at sort of this concept of how do you quantify uh, experience by communities. And when I mean experience by communities, I'm, I'm certainly talking about citizens, and, and, and this is what uh, you know certainly has been a lot of attention on that. But of course, it needs also organizations. So there's been some attention on that as well. Thank you, Maria. Uh, I'm, I'm down seven minutes. I have one and a half minutes. Uh, so, 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 so then, so this is an area that's quite interesting, um, and the unique part of this is, it's a survey-based technique, but the unique part of this is that this, the subject gets to tag uh, their own answers. Uh, and so, so this is an area that sort of self-tagging removes some of the bias that usually pre is presented in social science research, where subjects' responses are tagged by researcher, and here this is what we're trying to avoid. And so, I, as a matter of fact, I received some, some of the results uh, this morning as I was uh, here, so I haven't actually studied them very far. But basically, uh, the data collection started the, approximately a month ago, right after we got all the, the IRBs from all three institutions. Um, in one month, we gathered approximately 200 uh, points, uh, 200 information. These are citizens, not organizations, and the rate seems to be about 200 per, uh, per, per um, uh, a month, and so gearing to approximately 1,000 by the end of the year. And so, so there's some, again, I haven't studied this in detail, but some of the questions that were asked from the, the people seems to have that certainly property was not the main concern here, really. Certainly critical services were, were quite big, and, and uh, life quality was uh, there. And then there were some interesting uh, insights with respect to main, oh, this is pretty obvious, but then when you look at forming drastically different uh, living conditions and making 
uh, small changes. There is some interest. So there were some only small changes resulted in a certain level of, of resiliency. Now, mind you, the reason this is important here is because now we can layer with other information we have. So now there's quantitative values of social uh, experience. So there's more. Was it, uh, these are by the way codified, I haven't written the big. Was it linking with organizations and institutions that was important? Or was it bridging uh, existing collaborations or forming, I'm sorry, forming new collaborations with, with uh, other communities or reinforcing existing collaborations? So there was some interest in that, that, so, that the social services did not provide what was really required and needed by the communities. Um, and for instance, I know that I have only. 30 seconds left. <laughs> we have a couple of these more. So, so this stuff is uh, hopefully when we meet together, we can uh, uh, present some of this to you before. Uh, and I would like to also acknowledge the people who are, who are on the on the four tiers, yeah, uh, as I mentioned before. And I won't tell them uh, who their mother was and where they were born or any of that. All right. Thank you for that. <laughs> Last but not least is going to be our PhD student, Thomas Carvales. Uh, he's from Arizona State University. He's uh, a, a key member of the, this uh, large community that the Chris Body is, is enabling. And uh, Thomas uh, is trying to bring the, the pieces together, social infrastructure, uh, economics, uh, in a way that we can quantify uh, resiliency. So he's going to share some of these later results with Professor Amiberi uh, and others at uh, Alexandria State University. Are you going to give a show? Five minutes. Gosh. Thank you. <laughs> so, Thomas, uh, sorry, I was Yeah, gosh. I Because you are the most important person. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, since this is a panel, um, I thought what I would do, a uh, panel on social technical approaches, I would go, here's a bunch of stuff I've done before. Um, but given the interest of the time and we want to have a discussion afterward, I'll just keep it really, really brief. You guys can kind of ask Thank me you. more details afterward. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is show three different approaches, three so different social technical approaches. I'm going to focus on the quantitative uh, social metrics um, that speak someone to Maria and Donovan uh, spoke on uh, in terms of making planning decisions. Uh, I'm going to focus on this NSF CRISP project that Masoud just described, where we're really trying to integrate the social technical into a modeling framework. Um, I'll end with some really brief reflections. Um, so as I was telling Yana, I'm not really an engineer, but I always end up working for them. And usually they ask me, uh, give me a number for humans. Um, so this is uh, so this is one of, one of those times uh, in a project that did, uh, in collaboration with Ogresh National Laboratory um, and the City of Knoxville. Um, they wanted to build a tool to help them help them allocate uh, green infrastructure. Uh, so initially, when we asked them, you know, how do you decide where you, where you implement these infrastructure um, projects? Um, they let us know about some constraints that we were pre previously unaware of. So these decisions are normally made, well, there's, there's a vacant lot here, um, and this is where we might put in uh, some infrastructure, but they did want to consider social vulnerability and then climate change as well. Um, so in this tool, really briefly, uh, speaks on one way that social metrics and, uh, for, for measuring and monitoring social resilience can be used. Um, and it's basically a social vulnerability index that's married with a climate uh, vulnerability projection, downscaled. Um, and we did this in collaboration with the city, and based on feedback from city planners and engineers, we actually changed this, the scientific uh, methodology a little bit. Um, so this is based on established work originally, um, done by University of South Carolina, Susan Cutter, and the uh, Hazards of Vulnerability Institute has some pretty established methods. We adapted to them based on the decision-making processes that the stakeholders were telling us about. Um, so really quickly, this is what uh, the tool, at, at least at the time that I was working on it, uh, came out to be. Uh, so you see on the left-hand side, it has a, a panel where um, decision makers can actually switch on and off climate projections. They can incorporate different components of the social vulnerability index. Um, and then the darker spots kind of highlight where infrastructure might be um, allocated. Uh, and one neat thing, I, I, I don't know what the laser is, 
Um, we actually had different logins based if you were an engineer or a planner. Uh, you actually see different things. For example, this is the mayor's panel, so uh, it doesn't have all the different RCP climate scenarios that we uh, ran. Um, so in this, uh, this is a Chris project for Puerto Rico um, that Nisu just, just highlighted. Um, I kind of got, sort of got asked this question again this time uh, is to incorporate social metrics into uh, an engineering model of a power network. So um, overall, again, the project is aimed to, to integrate social tech into a modeling framework. So we need something quantitative that describes these complex social processes. Um, I'm not going to explain the whole methodology. It's similar to these, these structural, sociological-based approaches. Um, but these are some of the preliminary results um, that I got so far. Uh, so the darker spots highlight more resilient municipalities. Um, and then what you see over that is the power infrastructure uh, that describes uh, the power network in Puerto Rico uh, based on their last IRB report. And what we're trying to do is, is, is link these metrics in to where we can say, usually these, these network models, these power models will say if, if, if certain components are broken, which components do we repair in which order? And usually that function is based on economical considerations, repair cost functions, and we wanted to do something more than that. So uh, that's where we're trying to do <coughs> social metrics um, to try to bring that into these functions and overlay that into the infrastructure so that we can uh, take community resilience into account when we were um, uh, in the recovery process. Um, but these are, these are preliminary results that we want to do. Um, there's basically three main products uh, I'm trying to get out of this index. Uh, one is to kind of push the methodology a little further, specifically toward incorporating them in engineering models. Uh, in a past example, I was showing it more as a planning tool, but once we started to use it as a number in engineering models, there's a lot of assumptions that we have to be careful with. Um, so we kind of want to consolidate these variables and take them apart, um, and then maybe come up with some more sophisticated methods um, to, to make something a little bit more robust. Um, the second thing we'd like to do is to integrate with some of the other socially oriented research um, in our project, like the SenseMaker um, results that Masood just highlighted in that triangle. Um, how can we use community oriented research to feed back into this top down sociological method? Um, so we are uh, talking with uh, Jim Goh and Cognitive Veg and some people that are doing interviews, in-depth interviews with the select stakeholders and informants on the ground uh, to try to come up with this cross-scale insight. How can we come up with uh, some way to fit these different, um, these different approaches to try to understand social ecological research all together and kind of stack them up and relate to them. Um, the third product is a paper um, I've been working on for the past couple of months and hopefully we submit by January which takes into account the uh, complexity uh, that Don has been highlighted. So um, there's a lot, these kind of indices have been, been emerging uh, more and more in the past 10 years, uh, but there are a lot of assumptions that they do take. And in these complex processes, um, do these variables actually speak to complex systems? So I just kind of take them apart variable by, by variable um, and try to think about um, where, uh, how much to, to, toward complexity do these types of indices actually capture? Um, this third example I just glossed right over. Um, this was a third approach. Uh, but what I'd like to highlight here is uh, one of the approaches we take in, in the Resilient Infrastructure Lab that I work at Arizona State, where we view infrastructure as coupled infrastructure systems. So uh, physical infrastructure networks, of course, rely on soft infrastructure, so that's the institutional rules. Um, as well as natural and human infrastructure, things like knowledge. So I won't break down this figure, but if you guys want to ask me about it later, or I included the link of um, one, one example of uh, one way I've used qualitative information uh, by doing interviews in my hometown of Brazil to uh, try to establish what are the rules that govern infrastructure construction and resilience uh, that, that can actually be put into a qualitative model. Um, so I'll end with just some really quick remarks of uh, challenges and socio-technical approaches that I've just crossed in my um, early career. Um, again, these, these metrics, again, they, they've been emerging in the past 10 years, but I think there's, there's still more work to, to do there, particularly in, in trying to capture the process between the variables that are typically used. So we kind of usually make these assumptions, well, if, if you have a certain percentage of uh, disabled members in a community, 
uh, and a certain amount of vacant structures, they matter just as much as the other. We end up making these kind of equal weighting assumptions. Um, and how do these things interact? Because uh, we know in complex systems, things happen in nonlinear non uh, fashion. Uh, so how can we actually capture these in a quantitative way so we can uh, marry them into mathematical models? Um, and then and I put in this, this, this cost of interdisciplinarity uh, just to acknowledge uh, how much work we did in, in our project. We actually ended up uh, putting in time into a workshop where uh, we, uh, we sat down together and we really tried to uh, understand uh, each other's language. Uh, we got some really cool products out of that as well. So um, I'll go ahead and yep. wrap it up from there. <laughs> so we only have a few minutes for a questions, comments, so perhaps uh, the, the panel can jump in quickly and uh, we just open up to a, a few questions. We pray we'll still one minute from the from the hour. So please. Yeah. Please, yeah. We have a microphone here. Hi. Oh, yeah. um, one question I had is when, when I see these tools, I know how much work it goes into getting these tools to work and have uh, quality data and all that kind of stuff in the layers. What I was curious is, given all that work that goes into that, uh, what happens to them afterwards? How, how many of them are actually, well, I realize some of them are in the work, but plants in that case get used by other folks who are trying to understand this, practitioners, decision makers, communities. Uh, it's the thing one hates about a lot of academic research is it gets done, it gets published, it sits there, people move on, and you know, to the next person looks at it. So if you could give us an idea of either how they're being used or how they're potentially being used, what's the plan for them to be used? Who do you want to take a look? Well, I, I'll take the chair that corresponds to us. This uh, particular EIS application was designed for both research and planning, community planning. So the research part, we put together a group of uh, you know, researchers, we've met it a whole time, and it's, it's to focus on socioeconomic impact to, to trace the progress, uh, all the investments, and how the social actors actually may have some impact or not, and that's in progress, right? So. Presumably, that's the academic track and what the you know, legal paper is, and that's it. But the planner side, the community planning side, is intended to affect what goes on at the ground level, primarily by training planners and other community leaders in community vision. Uh, community vision is an exercise that we do in the economy by training, but you know, I, all my appointments have been in policy and planning schools, so I'm accustomed to this type of conversation. So the idea from our tool is to really train practitioners to do evidence-based you know, decision making as to what the plans are. Uh, for example, if you want to do it around development, you need to map the assets. So we have factories and this, and we have you know, bridges damage, and you know. So you need to take an assessment of the local area for that. So in our case, the whole tool was designed for practitioners to take action. Not necessarily to write papers, but the same data can be used for two, for two purposes. But I think uh, this is an exception in the sense that it has this very sort of purposely designed application. And so, and then we have a group of professors and, and whatever that are doing laboratories to to use as part of the training of community folks and people that do economic development and recovery at the local level. So our intention was very uh, purposely uh, to do community planning, which might be different from what we're more traditional. Yeah, I mean, my natural habitat is econometrics, right? So I'm saying this doesn't look like that. All right, maybe we can come back to uh, Can we ask questions? Or response? Yeah. Let me see. Uh, there's a question from, from the audience first, and then probably we will have more time, but you can ask him after. Please. So this one actually originated with um, Maria's first presentation, but I think a number of people can probably address it. Um, there was a lot of sort of, um, there was specific wording you had, monitoring and measuring characteristics of human resilience. And so I was curious as to when you monitor and measure those characteristics when you go into communities, um, what, what are those characteristics you're looking for? So that's not, it was, it was spurred by Maria's presentation, but I think a number of you can actually address that and how you're, you're looking at those characters. So, so I 
I'm going to say something that probably, I, I don't know how controversial it is because there are enough people who have experience in the space of, of the social and other metrics to, to relate to this. I don't think we've resolved what those characteristics are at all. Um, the work that I'm doing under the Community Resilience Program, and it's not, not within our Hurricane Maria work, is, is focused on identifying social and physical system metrics and natural system metrics that, that can go through some validation approaches and actually play around with differences of methodology, differences of scaling, all these issues that anybody who's worked in, in metric space knows these are all big issues, there are a lot of challenges, that they're all, are inherently they're oversimplifications, but um, because the pressure for how they will be used is so great, I think there's a lot of attention that needs to be spent on them. But I also think that it, one of the big things that I try to push is that we don't want to be looking at just post-disaster impacts. We want to look at things that we can, I, I use the word monitoring very intentionally, that we can monitor and watch along time and space in order to understand how communities respond to all kinds of changes and to be able to help identify areas that might be weaker or stronger in the same community. So you may have great economic activity but lower something else. So being able to look at those things and understand their change over time. We're intentionally taking over a little bit of the break, yeah. but I think it's fair to take it, all right? We'll it's just a very, very simple question. I, I have obviously heard in the past about the loss of electricity and how that affected people, but what I the first time that I heard how much, uh, how many people have lost their water during the, during the tragedy, and, and I was very impressed by that. And also, it's two very simple questions. One, was that essentially due to loss of power to the pumps at the, at the plants, the water treatment plants? And then the follow-up is, if so, you put a solution in your presentation, then, just to make sure you have that generator, cogen, or whatever you might choose. And has that been fixed yet? Has that been put in place yet? Wait, actually, sorry, yeah, we actually have a little bit more time, so thank you. <laughs> so, uh, so let's do this, yeah. Uh, so, like I said, I don't have first-hand experience with this uh, hurricane, but I talked to you for me before uh, time. Uh, so, what you mentioned, there are certain deaths that was directly related to people using contaminated water. So, think about all of this wastewater overflowing on the street, in the water, uh, lakes or reservoirs. You, know, if you use this water for cooking or even showering, there is a very big chance you get, you're going to get sick. Uh, so that is a fact, I would say. Now all of this water with the treatment facilities, they need electricity. Without power, they cannot function. Uh, so that's why when power is lost, they will just stop working. So that is another fact. Have they, have they put in place, get proper backup generators? Do I think they know they know have generators, but again, they can't last for too long. Yeah. You can maintain yeah. for a few days, but again, yeah. Yes, yes the, there, there are, uh, well, there is a, 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 a company that runs you know, water and sewer for real, but there are 207 dependent water companies in Puerto Rico. Okay, so my calls are private, you know, profits, what have you, there are a bunch of them. Those uh, 